What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 246. And we are so excited today to be talking about televangelists who are anything but holy. This is a topic we have wanted to dive into for some time. We're going to be talking about some prominent American televangelists, who they are, what they do, why they have mansions, luxury cars, and private jets. We discuss Joel Osteen's mega church and his mega millions, Jesse Duplantis and Kenneth Copeland's demon proof <laughs> private jets. That's right, people. Oh, man. Creflo Dollars, G6 fundraiser, and Paula White's angel summoning attempt. Ooh. Quite a lot to go over That's here a today. Tall order, man. Oh, yeah. It's going to be some fun times. This will be an interesting episode because I've been familiar with a lot of these individuals for a very long time. I actually went to a mega church here in Colorado. Nothing on the level of Joel Osteen or anything like that, but similar. I experienced a lot of similar things that they do at these some of these other mega churches. But you guys didn't grow up in the church, so. But I did get to go to the mega church. You with did you go one to, time. to my church one time. We sat up in the nosebleeds. That's how big it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 crazy. But it I mean, is. these guys are on just a whole different level mm -hmm. um, of wealth, and you know, there's reasons for that, which we'll get into. But I do want to preface this episode with not all pastors are bad. Not you took all Christians the words are bad. Right out of my mouth. Like, I was just about to say that. I know some people that are religious or, you know, Christian, go to church, things like that might be, you know, I don't want you, we don't want you to be offended by this episode because no. that's not the intention behind it. We know that there's lots of really great churches out there, do a lot of great things for the community. They're transparent with their money mm -hmm. and where it goes with tithes and offerings and, and donations and things like that. This is more so focusing on individuals who have mm -hmm. lots of evidence to back up the fact that they're anything but holy. They're scammers, um, exploiters, basically liars, basically. frauds. Yeah, or even demon possessed, as we'll see with <laughs> one of one of the individuals <laughs> well, that we'll talk about. A lot of you know Christians or other religions really look down upon people like this. Uh, well, you're you. These guys are so famous. They're like mm -hmm. celebrities that they're a lot of Christians are hate the fact that mm -hmm. this is what, you know, sort of secular society thinks of all Christians. Right. You, know, you might lump them all together. And but I can see that case. would be very frustrating. And and yeah, we do know and love several religious people and you know, we're several. not religious ourselves. <laughs> yeah. No, we but... have we know lots of people that are religious and go to church things yeah. like that and they're totally cool. And mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of good churches, but there's also a lot of churches that mm -hmm. mm, you know, are, their practices are definitely questionable. And a lot of my own say the least. personal experiences in the church are very questionable, mm -hmm. uh, to say the least. So, you know, uh, throughout this episode, I may give some of my own personal opinions on things and just know that this is from my own personal experience within the church and within Christianity. It has nothing to do with every single, you know, Christian or church out there. there uh, you know, I've been to a lot of great churches. I've known a lot of great pastors as well. So just wanted to put that out there before I get into it because, you know. You never yeah. know. We don't want people to feel offended. This is, no. you know, we're trying to have a, a kind of a lighthearted, fun conversation about this. Yeah, but we do love and appreciate our religious fans as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are all about the idea of coexist. Absolutely. No matter what belief, religion, or no belief you have. That's right. Everybody is accepted here. That's what this, that's what Malhar is all about. Except for these exploitive <laughs> Yeah. Unless you're exploiting people's most sacred part of their mm -hmm. essence of their being and that's spirituality and you're using that to profit off of them and mm -hmm. manipulate people and control people and that's where where i draw the line this episode of the podcast is brought to you by honey and babble also make sure you check out my merch if you haven't we still have a few items out there we're working on some new collections here hopefully i will be coming out in uh, the next month or so more on that though here in the future but uh also higher level wellness we got sleep products now if you haven't tried them yet Absolutely amazing stuff. Lavender. So really, really good just for your nightly routine. Mm -hmm. It's higherlovewellness.com. But don't want to be tooting our own horn, but these are fucking good. Yeah, we don't want to toot our own horn, but I'm really proud toot, of toot, these, toot. So toot, toot. I'm tooting away. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, let's just dive right into things and let's start by talking about this sort of this whole concept of televangelists. Because there's probably some people out there who've never even heard of televangelists before. Yeah. And maybe you grew up somewhere non-religious, non-spiritual whatsoever. And mm -hmm. so this is a totally new concept for you. So let me try to break it down for you. They are some of the most popular and flashy TV evangelists in the country. These men appear to have made a lot of money and they travel 
well, like kings. If I want to believe God for a $65 million plane, you cannot stop me. You Do you drive in limos? I'm a and- very wealthy man. One of my chandeliers costs more than most people's house. I got 22 chandeliers in the house. Of all the money and the government run great without the money and I'd give it away to other people. $54 million, I want you to imagine how many people could be fed, how many homeless could have places to sleep. <laughs> you kind of caught me off guard here, okay. Now you see why the devil tried so aggressively to discredit my voice. Get in a long tube with a bunch of demons. Why do you need a $54 million private jet? Why are your people touching me like this? Let go of me. Today I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, I will never be the same. In order to understand televangelists, we need to understand evangelicalism, which is a movement within Protestant Christianity that's had a huge influence over American culture and politics. It evolved as sort of a branch of Pentecostalism. Sometimes it incorporates elements of charismatic practice like faith healing and speaking in tongues. There are four enduring characteristics of the evangelical faith, the Bible, the cross, the concept of being born again, and activism. The United States has the largest proportion of evangelicals in the world. Evangelicalism is a transdenominational movement in Protestantism, meaning people of Baptist, Charismatic, Pentecostal, Calvinist, and other denominations can be evangelicals. So a lot of these evangelical churches are non-denominational. With the 80s came the rise of the American televangelist, a combination of the words television and evangelist. Put those two together, there you go. These are evangelical Christian ministers who broadcast their preaching traditionally on cable networks. And obviously before this time, radio was, you know, the big thing to broadcast on. But come the 60s and 70s and 80s, TV was the next thing, the newest thing to get on. And other religious broadcasters found it difficult to compete with these fundamentalists due to the fact that fundamentalists were so good at raising money and, Mm -hmm. you know, they could use that to pay for airtime. Um, and also, you know, because fundamentalists are so good at raising money, they're able to have like the latest technology that's required Mm -hmm. to have the best broadcast to be seen the most. And it really seemed like because of that, they were able to kind of get a leg up on other religious groups trying to do the same thing. And, you know, they were able to push for more donations and more donations. And before you know it, they're kind of monopolizing this sort of idea of televising church uh, cer- uh, services <laughs> Ceremon- online ceremonies <laughs> church <laughs> i'm uh, really trying to understand religion here <laughs> but yeah i mean they basically took over in a sense and were able to do what other organizations weren't able to do yeah it makes a lot of sense really i mean yeah. i think a lot it's a great point that if you go and look see what's on tv you don't really see other religious you know services on public television Not often. and again this is this is kind of fading because of the move to streaming and things like that but what they're doing is they're creating their own streaming platforms and apps and Mm -hmm. and things like that so they're come and with the rise of youtube and a lot of these other platforms they can just do it all themselves they don't have to go and pay you know the big networks to you know for airtime or slots anymore they just live stream from their youtube channel or from their website or facebook live or yeah podcast web shows i'd say like 90 percent of churches now stream their stuff live because mm-hmm. if you think about it it's a great way to not only get the word out the word of god out there but also to bring in new people and reach people yeah. that are in other states and, and influence because them. because every church is like a different flavor of ice cream <laughs> it, it really is they have all got their own sort of ways of doing things and they might even be part of the same denomination but every church is different you know you got to a head pastor at one church that you might like better than the head pastor at the church closest to you. So rather than driving all the way physically to this church, you can now just sit in your living room and live stream the mm-hmm. service right from right from the couch. And I would imagine that COVID and the pandemic lockdown was a mm. huge reason as to why this became so prevalent because yeah. now instead of, well, for a while when we were in lockdown, we people weren't going anywhere, but you, you know, a lot of people still want to experience that feeling of being in church and listening mm-hmm. to pastors and stuff. And so what better way to do it than in the comfort of your own home, mm-hmm. especially when you really couldn't leave your house. And a lot of them like film their actual service mm-hmm. that's in person, but then it's broadcasted to others to expand the reach. Mm-hmm. They're like influencers now. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them are. But there's also something 
that people like about going to a physical location too. Mm-hmm. Like it's just a different How you experience. feel the energy. Yeah, exactly. Right? When you, and when you're you're able to socialize and um, you know, it's fellowship is, is the word that they use is, yeah. you know, you have fellowship with your fellow believers and going to the church is great because you it's that day a week you all get together and you kind of catch mm-hmm. up and you know get recharged for the the coming week and yeah i can definitely see the appeal of that so i don't think they're ever gonna like disappear i don't think churches are just gonna all of a sudden only be virtual i think it's mm-hmm. gonna you know and especially since a lot of these especially these televangelists i mean they've spent millions and millions and millions of dollars to build these mega churches that are quite literally like stadiums or concert venues um which is so interesting because I, I think if I look back at my life and in all the churches I've been to, I think the churches that I had the most spiritual experiences were the more traditional ones that had like stained glass and yeah, you know, were older and felt more like a traditional church as opposed to a concert venue. Like some of the churches yeah. you walk in here and there's lights everywhere and then, you know, it's like a big show, but it doesn't feel like the traditional church, you know. There's mm-hmm. nothing like sitting in a pew. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> sitting in a wooden pew versus actually going and sitting in these like concert chairs. Like at my church, we had the flip chairs, you know, like at ballpark stadium oh, or yeah. concert venue where you fold it down, you sit down in it mm-hmm. versus pews, right? Yeah. Um, I, you know, grew up going to some random churches here and there. My parents wanted to like expose us to things and I can't even remember the it was type a of congregational church. church okay. Con- yeah. Congregational really small stained glass windows pews and it felt i felt that energy and that smaller too yes and when intimate. i went to yours i was like it really did feel like a concert or something yeah didn't no. i didn't feel like connected or inspired well the thing about the larger churches is that you can quite literally just be invisible when you go there yeah because you can just kind of slip in and sit down and mm-hmm. you don't really have to talk to anybody and there's so many people there that there's no way yeah. everybody's anybody's going to know that you actually were there mm-hmm. so it's some for some people it's more enjoyable because you just kind of slip in slip out and nobody knows you were even there versus if you go to a small church yeah if you go to a small church yeah it's hard to escape because everybody will see you leaving and Mm -hmm. you know there's less people to mingle with so true that yeah yeah televangelism is a uniquely and predictably american religious phenomenon it's a natural product of the cultural cross between american protestantism and capitalism That's because many of these televangelists take the gospel of material wealth and make it into a product. Yep, many of these televangelists live very luxurious lifestyles thanks to the money that they get from preaching. Televangelists often preach the prosperity gospel theology, a.k.a. seed faith, a Protestant movement pioneered by televangelist Oral Roberts. I was just going to jump in here and, and say something. So... Preachers, you know, talking about how much preachers make. Typically, a preacher makes um, different levels depending on what level of pastor you are within the church, which there's different mm. pastors. There's usually a head pastor, then there's a pastor underneath him, there's a youth pastor. So there's different pastors and they're all at different pay grades. But the head pastor, the one that's, you know, kind of usually if you look outside at the sign, that pastor's name will be on the sign for the church. But depending on how large your congregation is, usually reflects how much your pay is. Mm. So if you talk about mega churches where there's twenty thousand people attending, mega millions, they're making a lot. They're making a lot more money because the church is, you know, being funded by a lot more people. Versus, a, you know, you're just driving down the street. There's a little church on the corner. Chances are that pastor's really not making a whole lot of money. It's right. not like this. All pastors make tons no, and tons of money. Of it's not. just a select few that really preach at these larger churches that actually make, you know, quite a bit of money. So prosperity gospel is basically the idea that Christians can express their faith through positive thoughts, declarations, and donations to the church. And in return, God will bless them with health, wealth, and happiness. Salvation, according to the prosperity gospel, does not only come in the form of eternal life after death. God also saves his true believers in their earthly lives from poverty, illness, and other difficulties. To those who've accepted the prosperity gospel as true, God wants to and will bless his believers with material wealth and physical health in their lives. That's why the prosperity gospel is sometimes known as the health and wealth gospel. Sickness and poverty are considered curses that can be cured with atonement through faith in Jesus. 
faith in this case being giving money and having happy thoughts. Basically, being ill or poor can be seen as sort of a moral failing or a sign of weak faith or character. Again, Protestant work ethic stuff. So it basically seems like the idea is like, okay, if you have an issue, give money. If you're depressed, <laughs> give money. If you're sick, give money. If you're poor, I guess work harder, but also still give the money you can give. And pray. And yeah, and pray. And if you do all these things and keep giving money, then God will pay you back tenfold. Mm -hmm. So plant the seed. Mm -hmm. Adherents of the prosperity gospel donate money as a form of seed planting. The idea is that God will return this money to churchgoers tenfold. Basically, they will reap what they sow. God will give his true followers material wealth and good health. So that's why you'll hear televangelists ask their followers to quote unquote seed certain amounts of money because the idea is that you donate or seed that money. A metaphorical money tree will grow from that seed for you to enjoy. Giving money is a way to show God that you are a believer. Not only that, but you are willing to work to show it. So the tithing it's, is a very like has been going on for a long since the very beginning of the church. Mm -hmm. And this is this is the hard thing about it is like traditionally tithing it was a way to show your faith you know that you're serious and that you're willing to invest in put your money your with faith. your fucking mouth is. right exactly and in in the olden days when churches weren't all that big that money was put to use for the church it would pay for the building it would pay for yeah the, you know which makes the experience. sense it's like being and, part of a club or anything else yeah it's no different than with a, a reasonable like a membership fee. yeah yeah but then, but then it's been sort of twisted by the seed faith to create the illusion that mm -hmm. if you just give this money to God, then God is going to somehow bring it back to you. The more you give, with the more interest, you're get. you know yeah. what I mean. And so mm -hmm. it's almost like you're loaning <laughs> God interest. money, and God's this bank, and eventually He's going to write you a fat check, right? Or, or He's going to bless. They like to say blessings, right? Like mm. a blessing will will come upon you at some point in your life. And it will be a result of that seed that you planted. And it might come at a totally, and that's the thing about it is when you're dealing with faith, there is no logical, there's no contract, there's no agreement, there's no tangible way to know when that money's going to come back to you. So it's purely based on faith. So you're hoping that a blessing will occur and it will come in handy. Like say you all of a, you get in a car accident, you wreck your car, you get hurt, and not only are you okay health-wise, but somebody steps in and pays your bills or maybe your, the church pays your bills or you know something sort of miraculous happens and that's kind of the idea behind it is that bless you know by giving that money up front you're sort of building up this um bank account like insurance yeah sort of and you're gonna get paid out eventually from mm, it i see so yeah it's god speaks in dollar signs apparently yeah well, which is, which is funny because yeah, it's very backwards from it, it's who really Jesus yeah. essentially was. Well, money was, was like never thing, right? It's no. never like part of being no. a Christian. It's it was, been absolutely. It didn't matter how much money people. you had, it didn't how much money you gave. Like you gave what you were able to. Mm -hmm. Is more so. I feel like it's more so geared to the people that had an overabundance of wealth mm -hmm. that you share that wealth. Yeah, and not for the people that have literally nothing that are barely surviving to then give up what they need to survive in order to right you know hope that it will come back to them one of the most exciting things about a new year is that you have no idea what adventures are in store for you from new travel experiences to new jobs or picking up new skills there's no better way to prepare for 2023 than by learning a new language with Babbel. Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, you can feel confident no matter where the new year takes you. Lately, I've been watching a lot of 90 Day Fiance, and I especially like that show because I really like to see the people that actually learn to speak the language on where they're moving to versus the people that do not. And what you find is those that can speak the language in the new country have a much easier transition. Babbel makes that an achievable goal for you. And they make it fun. All you need is like 10, 15 minutes a day to spend on the Babbel app. I mean, you go to the bathroom a few times a day, just while you're on the toilet, pull up the Babbel app and learn yourself a new language. What makes Babbel unique compared to other 
language learning software out there is that they don't use AI. So you're not dealing with a computer talking to you. It's actually crafted by over 150 language experts, voiced by real native speakers, not computers. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages. So that's potentially 14 plus different countries that you might be moving to. Better learn the language. It makes that transition a whole lot easier. In the lessons, you can access podcasts, games, video stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee, so you got nothing to lose. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. And right now, folks, you can get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash milehire. That's babbel.com slash milehire for up to 55% off your subscription. Is Babbel language for life? But this whole idea gets people to donate their money. And since many of these seed faith televangelists are very, very wealthy, they point to their money as proof of this theology. In turn, they encourage their congregants to keep tithing, which is the religious tradition of giving one-tenth of something to the church. Which is a real thing. Yeah. I've I've seen some churches where they're literally like straight up part of like a, they have a tithing sheet that you fill out and you literally write what you make per year on there and then they give you back what you should be tithing to the church. Isn't that insane? Josh was telling me that last night. I was fucking So you read right so you'd be like I'm a school teacher, I make 30,000 a year and they'd be like, "Well, you got to give us a tenth of your gross income." And That's then sick. so then you're supposed to be tithing that because then then there become, you know, there's this whole level of membership within the church because it's like the way that churches work is that ultimately they want you to commit to the church and become a member because then you they've got this reoccur reoccurring revenue stream that they can count on and they can sort of hold you accountable for that membership versus those who and this is funny cuz my parents are very much like not about being a member of the church they'd mm -hmm. kind of be they'd be like as soon as the membership would come up they cuz they'll after a while of going they'll be like okay you've been coming quite a bit <laughs> been having you're a taking free food. advantage of the <laughs> donuts the show. and the, you know enjoying the show but it's time to like commit to the church and Pay be a up. member and mm. so they'd be like all right it's time to switch churches then <laughs> so then go to a new so church great. no i'm dead serious I, and and i'm sure if my parents are here they'd be like yeah we we definitely did that cuz i remember we would go to um my church would have this like once a year or whatever, it'd be like, we're having this big barbecue blowout after service. <laughs> like, no, no joke. They, they would bring in all this big food, bouncy castles. It was like Ooh, a carnival bouncy outside. Houses. Yeah. Mm, Kids. That's and it appealing. was like this, it was this like, and then there would be this meeting. So you'd come, you know, you'd have to like say, I'm interested in becoming a member. You'd come sit in this room. And I remember sitting in there and they'd be like talking like, okay, you know, like if you really want to like take advantage of the church and and you know, right, put your kid because if you think about it, they're also for families are providing childcare and True. all these other services for your family. And obviously it's not free. So you're like, we need need you to give something here. You can't just What if like, you say no? Are they gonna tell you not to come? They're not gonna tell you not to come. But they're but gonna give you like some side eye. Yeah, but you're definitely gonna be you're gonna make you feel uncomfortable. You're gonna be one of the way. favorite congregants. <laughs> you're gonna be in the nosebleeds. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> was it the whole idea? Dead serious too. Like, okay, for example, in my high school, it was really big to donate money to the school, and if you did, you were like treated a lot better. Yes, and, really, that was a thing. Oh, pff, absolutely. The rich families. I'm not gonna name names, but the rich families <laughs> would write checks. Please name names. And therefore, they would be treat like they would be on a first name basis yeah. with all the administration. They would have plaques in the hallway. You're whatever that's crazy and they would their kids were treated really well so it's wow. obviously exactly you don't have to though thing. but is it yeah the idea of like but if you write a good check like totally we'll make sure you're treated great your so, high school was like a university yeah it was crazy. it's it's exactly like that there were families within the church their last names which i won't name <laughs> they they like you'd be like yeah they were like legacy yeah. families, like multiple generations yep. have been through this church mm. and, and they would literally have reserved seats. In, yep. in the <laughs> That's sanctuary. literally how my high school was. So like insane. if you were new to the church, you, there's no way you're getting a first through like 10th row seat. All those seats are like reserved. The same people sat in the same seats mm. every Sunday. And you could always look down and see in the first couple of rows to be, you know, that those are like kind of the premier families mm. of the church. VIP. <laughs> So, That's insane. so my God's family favorite. and I in the nosebleeds would be like looking down through binoculars. <laughs> like, Oh, look who it is. They're down there. Stop. And we would so never funny. sit down there because we knew like mm. visitors usually go to the nosebleeds. 
up in the balcony. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. that's crazy. And the members would sit in the first front rows and things like that. So some Christians have labeled the prosperity gospel as heresy. They say that this theology goes directly against biblical teachings that warn about the rich having lots of trouble making it into heaven. And it doesn't fit with the important teaching of helping thy neighbor, especially the poor. To these Christians, many televangelists are nothing but scammers and charlatans. Agreed. Seed faith or prosperity gospel has been considered sort of an aberrant theology that should be avoided. Critics say that Jesus himself probably would ask these wealthy televangelists to sell off their fast cars and faster planes and give that money to the needy. But televangelists say that God wants them to enjoy their prosperity. So, is this theology compatible with biblical teachings? We'll let you decide. So in the book of Matthew, in the New Testament of the Bible, a rich young man walks up to Jesus and asks him how he can earn eternal life. Jesus advised him to follow God's commandments. The rich young man assured him that he followed these commandments and asked what else he could do. And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he became very sad because he had great wealth. He says, damn. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> Is there another way? <laughs> I ain't giving up my donkey, all right? <laughs> my do <laughs> I ain't walking on foot. <laughs> These feet are not made for walking, all right? Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. Love that verse because that is so crystal clear about why televangelists are such hypocrites, right? Because it is easier for a camel to go through a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Yeah. And they somehow just kind of like skip over that section. You know? <laughs> They're like, oh, we don't have or to talk they, about that. Or they'll spin it in a way that fits their narrative. Yeah. But apparently God made some exemptions to this rule. Oddly enough, there are no Bible passages concerning private jets. So because private jets aren't in the Bible <laughs> thousands of years ago, then it must be okay. Then we haven't, you know, it's just not the right translation. In, <laughs> in Luke chapter 6, verse 20, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 25, Jesus warned, Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Hmm. Wise words. So back in 2007, Republican Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley started a Senate Finance Committee to probe into six televangelists. You see, most of these ministries and their megachurches are considered tax-exempt organizations in the United States. And most of you probably know that, but if you didn't, it will really piss you off to learn about this. And a lot of the luxury goods that these televangelists enjoy, like planes and mansions, are paid through ministry funds and classified as church expenses. That's right. So the probe was to investigate if these funds were being misused by televangelists who were exploiting their ministry's tax-exempt status. Sadly, this probe was abandoned in 2011 after lots of pressure from church groups, but it still gave the public some insight into the lives of these celebrity pastors. So now we're going to take a look at some of the most popular televangelists and dive into some of their controversies that have followed them, starting with... Mr. Joel Osteen. Joel Scott Osteen is one of the most popular and recognizable televangelists in the United States. Joel's parents founded the largest church in America, the Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. The church is a 600,000 square foot former sports arena that can seat 16,000 people. Before the pandemic, the church regularly saw 43,000 members at their weekly services and 13 million people from 100 different countries tune into Joel's TV broadcasts every week. 13 million people. <laughs> That's fucking nuts. This guy is, yeah, and, and he's spread out all over the place. I mean, he's got podcasts, he's got TV, mm -hmm. he's, got, he's got everything. I mean, he goes on tour. He, he is like... <laughs> he's still got nothing on Mr. Beast, like, though. No, that's true. <laughs> Mr. Beast got him beat. Can't big touch time. his subscribers. But still, for a televangelist, I mean, yeah. he's by far the biggest, probably the biggest reach too. So Joel preaches 
Very simple, positive sermons that focus little on topics such as sin or the devil, because why would he do no. that? Keep the vibes high. <laughs> right. Keep people happy and feeling good, right? Yep. Not let's yep. let's avoid revelation. He doesn't want to we? stir the pot or offend anybody or upset people. Right. Whatever's gonna make them feel good and send that cash. <laughs> so he's basically a inspirational, motivational speaker. Yep. With like a hint of uh, Christianity sprinkled in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he's also earned the nickname the Smiling Preacher for his youthful and approachable appearance. I mean, he just seems like the nicest guy, right? He just seems like, you know, Joel, you have Joel over. He's just, ah, just makes you feel so good, you know? He's I don't such know. A wholesome in, I look individual. at him and I just see evil. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> he looks like the Joker. What? Whoa. Okay. <laughs> But his church rakes in $43 million a year in collections alone. Collections alone. They also make millions from TV viewers who send in donations, although Joel doesn't ask for money. According to the Houston Chronicle, in the year ending March 2017, Lakewood Church made an income of $89 million. Tax exempt, baby. Over 90% of that income was raised from church congregants. Yeah. Just from the people enjoying the church. Mm. That's insane. So you might be wondering where all those millions went. Well, most of it was spent on booking TV time, weekly services, and making Joel's Night of Hope event, a nationwide stadium tour. So how much did Lakewood spend on charitable causes? <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> Only $1.2 million, which still it's $1.2 million. You know, can't completely say it's nothing, but it's barely 1% of its budget. That's to charitable causes. Absolutely insane. And he also spends a lot of money towards producing his books and oh, book yeah. tours. And he uses the church money for that. Right. Which his earnings from that don't go back into the church. No. It goes into his pocket. Right. Plus, he already, I don't even want to know what the salary is he gets paid from the church. I'm sure he gets paid millions of dollars well, every year from the church. Not anymore. No. He actually mm. no longer accepts the $200,000 salary from the church. Oh. Yeah, because I mean that wasn't looking good for him, and he doesn't need that money. That's that's, I don't even believe that to be honest with you. Two hundred thousand dollars salary. There's no way for this big of a church. My pastor at my church was making like two hundred fifty grand a year. How do you know that? It they have to release. They release some of that oh, information. Oh, cringe. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. I'm pretty sure he was making like two hundred grand a year. Who's deciding this? Like, who's the boss? Yeah. Of who's the, the boss pastor? of the church? They that's have a, like a board. They have. The, okay. They have like a group of individuals that are kind of it's kind of like a yeah they're voted in like an hoa <laughs> sort of yeah you know there's like a group that hires the pastors and things like that well anyway joel graciously no longer accepts this two hundred thousand dollar salary because the royalties he's making on everything else yeah he ours. doesn't need it that's chump change to him and, th and think about that though for a moment it, that's such a great statement for him to make to his audience exactly like, i don't even take a salary here I right do that's this the reason free. why praise god i do this for mm -hmm. free <laughs> and he makes more by saying something like that because people are like oh poor joel let me Give write a bigger more. check yeah exactly i now i know it's not going to joel so mm -hmm. but meanwhile he's pulling all this money to benefit yeah. himself yeah he is while saying it's his ministry don't get it twisted people he is a very very rich man with a net worth of 50 million dollars he makes money from his book sales, like we said, and also doing speaking engagements. He's made millions of dollars in his career, and those millions have been used to fund a lot of luxuries, like a $10.5 million, 17,000-square-foot mansion in a wealthy Houston suburb. Look at that thing. Wow. Look at that. The pool in between, the guest house. He, he lives like a side? pro athlete, basically. Oh, for sure. So his mansion sits on about two acres of land and reportedly has six bedrooms and bathrooms, five fireplaces, three elevators, a guest house, an outdoor pool, and a pool house. Joel says that these material gains are God's blessings. And like other televangelists, Joel uses that logic of God wanted me to have money and we give back a lot to justify his personal wealth. And just like many other mega churches, the Lakewood Church is tax exempt. So here's the thing. The church is a business at the end of the day. Yes. And I think everybody would feel differently about, about this and even these televangelists if they had to pay their fair share of taxes, right? I, I think, and if we started treating churches like businesses, 
then I think a lot of this animosity and, and stigma around you know these mega churches and televangelists would sort of die down a little bit at least because it how how would a church be any different than any other CEO of a business right that's mm -hmm. making millions of dollars every year it's not like everybody's like blasting every rich person that you know business owner that makes millions of dollars it's the fact that they're tax exempt that really pisses people off when it's clear that they're really a business yeah, right fully abusing the system right so you may have heard of Joel Osteen back in 2017 during Hurricane Harvey. People began to speak out against the Lakewood Church for not opening its doors to first responders and victims of the hurricane. This was absolutely insane. <sighs> in an August 27th, 2017 Facebook post, Lakewood Church said it was inaccessible due to severe flooding. The post directed evacuees to a list of other shelters in the area. Bullshit. But social media users were quick to upload photos of the neighborhood that showed the streets around the church were wet but clear. Joel responded by saying that the church wasn't open because it was flooded with a foot of water. Other reps from the church seemed to confirm this and posted photos of the water damage to the church. Later, he told the press that the church's doors were always open and many people still criticized the amount of time it took the church to provide some sort of disaster relief to the community. Let's hear Joel's response to the criticism. You know, I, th I think, George, the narrative is that we didn't want to take people in or that we didn't open in time is, you know, it's totally not true. We were we were here for people. We were shelter. We were taking people as soon as the as the floodwaters receded when several people came here to take them in. But uh, the city has a shelter four miles from here. We work with the city all the time. And when their when their shelter was totally full, they started bringing people over here. And here we are again today doing it like we did in 2001 when we housed 3000 people. So. I don't know, I think somebody created that narrative that somehow we were high and dry, and, and none of that is true. This building, it was a safety issue, and we took people in from the very beginning. You do seem to be up and running now, but any lessons learned from this? Well, I think there always is, but I think, George, sometimes it's, you know, when somebody's not in this situation where we had nobody in this facility. We had we were fearing that it would flood. The last thing we would do is put people in it right at the beginning. But yeah, you would you know we would probably be you know do some things differently, obviously. But you know my niece was stranded right across the street from this building the first two days of the flood on on the or one day of the flood on the freeway. So it was it was a big flood and it affected all of the people that run this facility as well. But. Uh, you know what? We've been here 60 years helping people. We're going to be here long after all this dies down, so he's helping these positivity. people as well. <laughs> he's oh, like, shut yeah. up with your negativity. Yeah. Everything's fine on here. It's interesting that he used the, the term high and dry when he's trying to convince everyone that it was wet. Very strange. So he claimed that his church didn't receive any money from the CARES Act, which provided pandemic relief to individuals, families, and businesses. But that wasn't true. It was revealed that Lakewood Church got $4.4 million in federal aid from the CARES Act. This $4.4 million was given to the church in the form of a PPP loan, if you remember those. Now, we couldn't do an episode on televangelism without talking about Mr. Kenneth Copeland. Mm. And he's pretty different in his ministry from Joel Osteen. We're going from the smiling preacher to whatever the hell Kenneth <laughs> Copeland is. Here's a creepy as fuck video of Kenneth Copeland laughing at the idea that Joe Biden is president. <laughs> and I swear... It looks like he has vampire teeth. I know. The media said what? <laughs> what? what? The media said Joe Biden's president. Joe. <laughs> 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 ha As he continues to open his mouth, you can see his teeth. <laughs> Dude, he is fully off his rocker. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I can't tell. Wow. Does he like Joe Biden or not? I don't know. I don't know. How does he feel about Joe Biden? <laughs> so he was clearly like one of the people that believed Trump actually won the election, it seems like, based mm -hmm. on that reaction. Yeah, I would say so, based on that. <laughs> but later on, Kenneth did tell his ministry that he loved Joe Biden. So who really knows? Kenneth Copeland was actually Oral Roberts' personal chauffeur and pilot before he got his start. He founded his ministry in 1967 
and he spent decades preaching to Christian TV viewers across the country. And this preaching made Kenneth a very, very rich man. Also, before he became um, what he is today, he used to be a singer. Yeah. Hell yeah. Can you look up some of this? Sure. I wonder if he's copyrighted it. We might have to. I don't think so. We'll see. This he didn't have years a ago. very bad voice either. It's not. It's not. No, it's do, very old. Do you um, type in Kenneth Copeland singing to Gloria or something? Yeah, he likes serenades. Pledge of love. Good old singing voice. Oh, no, this is him when he's old, though. Yeah, that's all right. I want to hear his original songs. He was like trying to make it as an artist. See that one? Okay. Pledge of Love, 1957. Yeah, obviously he had a major switch in career path there. He probably should have, should have stuck with the music. I don't think he was that bad. Well, I think he sings to his congregation sometimes. Oh, okay, so. yeah, it did seem like so. It keeps it video. going. Hmm. Hmm. Like other televangelists, Kenneth believes in the sanctity of marriage. So he's been divorced twice and married three times. His wife Gloria is also a minister at their church, and two of his daughters have also gone on to become ministers. Oh, I just love the hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kenneth has proudly said that he is a rich multimillionaire. He has no issue talking about or even boasting about his vast personal wealth. This includes a mansion, lavish vacations, and multiple private jets. Because you know what they say about private jets. Once you have one, you just can't stop mm -hmm. buying more. <laughs> Let's hear Kenneth talking about flying commercial airlines. Mm, one of my favorite sound bites from him. Now, Oral used to fly airlines, right. but it, even back mm -hmm. there then, man, mm -hmm. it, it got to the place where it was agitating his spirit, sure. people coming up to him. He right. had become famous, and they wanted him to pray for him and right. all that. You, you, can't, you, you can't manage that today. Right. The, this dope-filled world. Right. Dope. Get, in an air, get in a long tube with a bunch of demons. Right. <laughs> That's how he's talking about his own people, people of God who want them to pray for him or pray for them. Or potential people he could save. Yeah. He's like, oh, they're annoying. A bunch of, bunch of demons, demons on the plane. <laughs> so fucking whack. 2006, Kenneth announced the creation of the Angel Flight 44 ministry that would fly food and release supplies to countries affected by natural disasters. Money was fundraised for the ministry, but the public didn't really see any results from it. Later, after the 2010 Haiti earthquake, Kenneth was called out for not using the Angel Flight 44 ministry to provide the country with disaster relief. His ministry responded by saying that all the money went toward plane repairs. <laughs> well, spent all this money on planes and they don't even run. You got to repair them. <laughs> it wasn't enough to fly a relief mission due to these repairs. Kenneth still got use out of his private jets, though. Don't worry. He's taken some of these jets on personal ski trips and exotic game hunting. You see, like Kenneth said before, flying commercial is just too much for him to bear. And a lot of people raise their eyebrows. That is tube full of demons comment that you just saw. <laughs> In 2019, Inside Edition journalist Lisa Guerrero was able to get a brief unplanned interview with Kenneth to talk about his private chats. This is probably one of the best clips of him out there. Oh, yeah. This is one of my favorite clips on the internet. Yeah, period. Is... I want to watch the whole thing. How are you, sir? We'd just like to ask you about why you don't want to fly commercial. Why have you said that you won't fly commercial? You said that it's like getting into a tube with a bunch of demons. Why do you think well, that? No, no, listen to me just singing. <laughs> Not the people. His smile. The main reason is because of the need. If, if I flew commercial, I'd have to stop 65% of what I'm doing. Or get that That's really <laughs> Isn't it true that you want to fly commercial so that you can fly in luxury? How much money did you pay for Tyler Perry's Gulfstream jet, for example? Well, for example, that's really none of your business, but... Ooh, isn't sassy. it the business of your donors? Listen, I paid. Look at the anger brewing in his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of caught oh, me off guard here, okay? Certainly. Well, if you like 
like to come out here, I'd like to give you a chance to to catch your breath and and have a conversation. We don't want to we don't want to catch you off guard. I love Inside Edition. You got to get this now. Hey, you listen to me. My my wife thinks Inside Edition is oh yeah. <laughs> now, thank you, Lord. Help me. Just let me, let me pray. Lord help. Without the air prayer that we have that I bought from Tyler Perry. And I didn't pay anywhere. And Tyler's one of the greatest guys. He made it. He made that airplane so cheap for me. I couldn't help but buy it. <laughs> My question then. Well, 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 okay. All right. But I want to get to the demons because people are very concerned about demons. that comment. Give me a chance here, Inside Edition. Okay. I love your eyes. And uh, juice them up a little bit. Here's what happened. We flew in 21 days. 70 hours, 40,000 miles, touched five continents, and preached face-to-face personally with 125,000 people. Do you ever... Do you ever use your private jets to go visit your vacation homes, for example? Yes, I do. Okay. Again, getting back to the comment... You said that you don't like to fly commercial because you don't want to get into a tube with a bunch of demons. Do you really believe that <laughs> human like, beings are demons? No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. Oh, oh <laughs> scary. Talk about a demon. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, it's like, but principalities and powers. Can and you explain what you meant by that, yes. that, by that term then? Yes. Just, just explain, because it's really simple. You said you didn't want to get into a tube with a bunch of demons. What did you mean? <laughs> The, well, Once again. let me ask you. Do you think that let people that fly you. commercial are demons? If you give me a chance to talk, sweetheart, I'll explain this to you. But it's a biblical thing. It's a spiritual thing. It doesn't have anything to do with people. People. Right. I love people. Jesus loves people. But people get pushed in alcohol. Do you think that's a good place for a preacher to be and prepare to go preach to a lot of people when somebody in there is dragging some woman down an aisle? It made me so mad to see that on television. I wanted to punch the guy out myself. I can't be doing that while I'm getting ready to preach. So you just don't like to be around the sinful people or the, the hurtful people. Is that what you're saying? Not the people, baby. Not the people. You say I baby? could no longer do what Breathe. I call to do and be on the airlines besides that i need my clothes when i get there <laughs> you have some fancy clothes i mean I for one. a pastor you are living a life of luxury yes, you've am. got great homes yes, you've got yes, great yes, planes do. you do you drive in limos I'm a and very wealthy man you're a very wealthy man yes yeah and some and people I'm would not, say I'm that is it something. is it appreciate may, may i add something to that uh, I, I, my wealth doesn't come from offerings alone. Because okay. you sell things, books and DVDs. <laughs> yes. And I have a lot of natural gas on our property. Didn't know that, did you, babe? Now I do. Ew. Yeah, you Creepy. do. Isn't that wonderful? Baby. Well, I guess. It's wonderful for you. Oh, he's got natural gas freak. on his property. Dude, his eyes. He looks like a lizard person. For sure. If anyone's a lizard person, it's Kenneth Copeland. Locked. So when the lockdown began in the U.S. in 2020, churches weren't able to hold their usual services, as we discussed earlier. So mega churches, as you can probably imagine, took a decent hit. On April 2nd, 2020, Kenneth decided it was up to him to put a stop to the virus. <laughs> Look, you're Kenneth Copeland accent there. So here's a clip oh, of the sermon he gave that day. This is this guy is a mm, full on comedian. On like, he really is. This guy's a comedic genius. The character. <laughs> when, when, when Almighty, Almighty, strong, strong, South wind, South wind, heat, heat, burn this thing, burn this thing. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Satan, you bow your knee. Satan, you bow your knee. You fall on your face. You fall on your face. He's laughing at himself. COVID-19. COVID-19. Oh, those teeth. <laughs> I blow the wind of God. The wind of God. On you. On you. He's 
guys in the you background. You are destroyed forever. You are, you are destroyed, destroyed forever. forever. And you will never be back. And, and you will never, never be back. Uh, pff, wrongo. And just as we all know, after that sermon, the pandemic came to an abrupt end. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He's a miracle worker. He is. But anyway, Kenneth told his followers who lost their jobs to keep teething, tithing, tithing, saying, <laughs> tithing. Thank you. <laughs> Got teething on the brain these days. In other words, that means keep sending him the Benjamins. Meanwhile, Kenneth boasts a net worth of seven hundred sixty million dollars. And yet Texas taxpayers are footing the tax bill for his seven million dollar mega mansion. And that's because the house is classified as a clergy residence. In addition to its massive size, the house also has a tennis court, two garages, and a covered boat, boat. boat dock with three slips. Look at this fucking thing. It's incredible. Clergy residence. What, how many people live there with him then? Looks like a hellscape, though, around it. Everything's dead and sad. This house is 18,000 square feet with six bedrooms and six bathrooms. It sits on one acre of land with a 24-acre lakefront tract. The land is valued at a mere $125,000. Eagle Mountain International Church, which Kenneth founded in 1967, owns the home. So the church pays less than $3,000 a year in property taxes. The house is also right near the private airport owned by the church, which is very convenient for Mr. Private Jet. Meanwhile, Kenneth and his wife, Gloria, continue to preach and take money from their followers, and a lot of them have been preyed upon for their faith. This exploitation reaches some of its most disturbing levels when Kenneth and Gloria do laying of the hands or faith healing, in which they pray over people with severe disabilities and ask God to cure them of things like immobility or even Down syndrome. Which we'll play a little clip of it. It is a little... It's kind of offensive. Yeah, but I think it's important to play it because it just shows the the real reality here. But this could, way, this could the, bother some of you. For the, sure. the way that he does it, though, because it's like at my church, we also did this laying of the hands sort of thing. Where, oh, really? Oh, yeah. Like somebody would have cancer or something. Everybody would come up and pray. We'd pray over them. But the way that Kenneth prays versus how many other pastors pray is very different. Mm -hmm. Kenneth, the way that he goes about it, it almost seems like he's channeling God through him and he's like trying to he scare had it out like of you. him and his wife have these like healing hands that are mm -hmm. actually doing the healing. Which a lot of people like, do believe in like the power of positive thoughts and yeah, you know, yeah. sending goodwill just the, to people. The way the way he goes about it is just is honestly disturbing. So yeah, again, this video could be offensive to some of you but i think it's important that we see the reality of what these people are fucking doing we, we we're going to have some changes in this spot oh yes thank amen you, lord. thank you lord amen I command her body to be loose yes to be amen. free to be healed to be restored <laughs> thank you the top lord. of her head to the soles of her feet thank you lord jesus thank you lord, thank you, lord. She's free. We call her free in Jesus' name and healed everything about Glory her. Glory to God. No, no bad symptoms. Glory to no God. sickness. No disease. Glory, glory, Made whole glory, by the glory, power glory, of the living God. Glory, glory, Jesus is our healer. Glory untangled. to God. Untangled. Mm. Glory to God. Speaking. Yeah. Amen. Really Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Fingers, be loosed in the name of yeah, Jesus. Yeah, amen. Be normal in the yeah, name of Jesus. Amen. Work be right normal. in uh, Jesus. Yes, Disgusting. amen. Jesus gave her these fingers, and we call them healed. Yep. He gave her healed amen. fingers. Healed fingers. All right. Glory. Yeah. Enough of that. This poor woman. This is so sad. Yeah. It's so exploited. They have no it's shame. It's crazy. It's, it's just... terrible. Because it's... <sighs> I mean, you're 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 saying you're healing somebody who has an incurable disease, and you're you're the way they're going about it is as if they're ac actively healing her, or yeah. she's going to be healed as a result of the, the fact these that these prayers are saying. They said, "Make her normal." It's disgusting. I would be so offended to be in that room. I can't even imagine. It's just, it's so sad. There was one specific example I wanted to mention of a person convinced that Kenneth could save her from cancer. 
Her name was Bonnie Parker, and she had been a dedicated follower of Christ for a long time. And unfortunately, at some point, Bonnie was diagnosed with cancer. But she listened to Kenneth's uh, teachings very often, and she said that they gave her a lot of hope. And Bonnie was convinced to sow money into Kenneth's ministry, and she believed that if she donated to the church that she would reap the benefits of healing. And Bonnie's daughter, Christy, has estimated that Bonnie ended up possibly donating hundreds or even hundred thousands of dollars. Um, Bonnie was convinced that Kenneth could heal her and, you know, she would even participate in the lottery in hopes of winning money so that she could then donate even more money to Kenneth in hopes that this would heal her. Um, Unfortunately, she ended up passing away, but her family says that she died believing that she didn't give enough to Kenneth. That is so sick. And and these people, another thing that they talk about a lot, they they have a very negative view on the healthcare system too. Mm-hmm. And uh, cancer treatments, they've I've heard them speaking yeah, Gloria, about yeah, yeah Gloria, Gloria talking about um, how chemotherapy is poison, and you know th- there should be an alternative, which is listening to them, sending the money, and praying to God. It's just it's absurd. It's so exploitive that it should be a crime. It really is. I, I mean, think it's all like, of this is a crime. Because you're, you're exploiting somebody's spirituality in order to reap the mm-hmm. benefits from it. Yeah, it, It's somebody who's in the most vulnerable state in their life. I mean, they're dealing with a, a, a potentially a terminal illness. Mm-hmm. And in the face of that, rather than supporting them and lifting them up, it's one thing to support, lift up, and pray together. Mm-hmm. But to make it seem like you are somehow closer to god than the rest of uh, of everybody else and that's the way that that's what always drove me nuts is when pastors would carry themselves in such a way that made you feel like they were above you somehow yeah. that because they're this pastor mm-hmm. and, and yeah, this they power. lead this church that they somehow possess abilities that the average believer doesn't mm-hmm. and that's where that's why like speaking in tongues and things like that that's why you know by doing that in front of people, you're you're convincing other people that somehow you are more spiritually enlightened than the rest of them, and therefore leading people to believe that God is utilizing you you as the pastor and head of this church to do His work. And that's the thing. There's just so many gray. Li- there's just so many gray areas and lines um, that get crossed all the time. And I think, and and that's ultimately what really bothered me about the churches I went to is this idea that certain individuals were somehow closer to god than Mm -hmm. you were Mm -hmm. and you had to go through them to then gain access to to god which is just completely false in in my opinion and so that's what bothers me the most about kenneth copeland is he carries himself in such a way that he is this powerful he thinks he's like a god in a way exactly he's like this prophet and like in the Bible, of course, there's miracles that happen. There's people that, um, normal people, so to speak, that allegedly perform miracles, like curing curing people of illnesses and things like that. So it's it's this modern day rendition of that that they're trying to exploit. When in actuality, I, I bet if we were to look and see, has anybody that Kenneth Copeland ever prayed over actually been healed? No, I there's mean it's probably it's no examples of that. Completely whack and. Also, we didn't show this part of the clip, but later in that same video, they pray over a girl with Down syndrome and ask God to give her the right number of chromosomes. It's horrible. It's so offensive. It's it's spiritual abuse. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Fucking sick. So in that video where Kenneth talked about tubes with demons, there was another man agreeing with him on the demonic perils of commercial air travel. And that man was none other than televangelist Jesse Duplantis. In a different Kenneth Copeland Ministries video, Kenneth told a story about one of Jesse's mishaps on a commercial flight. The devil was actually trying to kill him, which just happens sometimes. Let's hear that heartwarming story. Now, Jesse Duplantis, several of them, the devil tried to kill him on the airplane, and one time, they, he just went up and took the mic away from the stewardess and started praying over the whole thing. Flaps wouldn't come down. That's a bad deal in the big earth. Yes, sir. But they did. (laughs) (laughs) 
Because of course it was the prayer that did it, mm -hmm. right? Of yeah. course, Jesse's prayer saved the day. So maybe Jesse needs to fly private because this incident put him on a watch list, <laughs> which would make a lot of sense. What would you do if some random old man went on the intercom and started praying? Would that make you feel better or worse? So Jesse shared Kenneth's concerns. He'd been an enjoyer of private jets himself, so much so that he'd actually worn out three whole private jets provided by his ministry. And so in 2018, God clearly, not having more important shit to do like solving world hunger or climate change, told Jesse to believe that he would give him a new plane. And not just any plane. Apparently God told Jesse specifically that he'd give him a Dassault Falcon 7X. This is the story according to Jesse. God said, Jesse, you want to come up here where I'm at? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I want you to believe in me for a Falcon 7X. So I said, okay. But the first thing I thought of was, well, how am I going to pay for it? Then Jesse remembered something. God told him in 1978, Jesse, I didn't ask you to pay for it. I asked you to believe for it. The 7X is a three-engine private jet capable of carrying 12 to 16 passengers at speeds of up to 700 miles per hour. This plane would be Jesse's fourth fourth and it cost a whopping 54 million dollars oh, i can barely say that that's insane that's a really really nice plane mm -hmm. so of course jesse turned to his followers to fund the plane he just needed to fly private because he had a busy schedule and he couldn't use one of those other three planes that he had he needed this new one because it could travel to places around the world in one trip without refueling as we all know layovers can indeed be demonic but has Jesse ever heard of an airport bar? <laughs> Jesse posted a video announcing fundraising for the plane. He basically explained to his congregation that Jesus, if he were here today, would not be flying Spirit Airlines, of course not. And when Lisa Guerrero from Inside Edition, who we saw earlier, asked him about his jet fundraiser, she didn't quite get an answer out of him, of course. Let's take a look at that. I really believe that if Jesus was physically on the earth today, he wouldn't be riding a donkey. Think about that for a minute. He'd be in an airplane preaching the gospel all over the world. I believe in God for a brand new Falcon 7X so we can go anywhere in the world one stop. My congregation is the world. I need the plane. So for you that don't think I should have that plane, God told me to have that plane. Mm -hmm. Why do you need a $54 million private jet? We're not doing any kind of interviews right now. I'm in a book. I just like to know why you need a private Keep your hands off me. Why are your people touching me like this? Because you need to wait. Let go of me. She's gone. You go, Lisa. Oh, I can hear her hollering. <laughs> and I can stand back and say, what'd you do with her? He said, I made her outside edition. <laughs> Oh, Good one, oh, burn. <laughs> Better outside. outside edition. Oh, goddamn. So of course he doesn't want to answer that. So it's it's just it's manipulative. It's like, oh, the world is my congregation, so mm -hmm. therefore I need the fanciest jet possible, so I can just go all over the world and preach the gospel. And and that excites people, though. That excites you know people of his church, and mm -hmm. they got him the damn airplane. Yeah, trying to convert as many people as he can. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. You guys know that feeling when you find a deal and you save some money, you feel excited, you feel smart, you feel lucky. It almost feels like you're getting a treat for free. And thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past because Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one that it finds to your cart. Just imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites and when you check out, the Honey button just appears and all you have to do is click apply coupons, wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons that it can find for the site and if Honey finds a working coupon, you'll just get a sit back and watch the prices drop. Recently, we have been buying a bunch of new equipment for our studios. We have been upgrading everything and we actually found some Honey codes. Honey was able to find us some promo codes and we were able to save over $200 on our new lighting, which was fantastic. And Honey doesn't just work on desktops, it works on your iPhone too, which a lot of people don't know that. You just activate it on Safari on your phone and you can save on the go, which is great. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out friends. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting our show. So get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash milehire. That's joinhoney.com slash milehire. 
So Jesse Duplantis isn't the only televangelist who's tried the old divine command PJ trick. <laughs> this guy's name just cracks me up. I know. Creflo Dollar, all right, <laughs> is the founder of the non-denominational Christian World Changers Church International based in College Park, Georgia, a suburb of Atlanta. The church has satellite campuses across the U.S., and Creflo became a televangelist after he was mentored by none other than Kenneth Copeland and Oral Roberts. I love the fact that his last name is Dollar. I know. So good. Uh -huh. Amazing. Like the other televangelists we've talked about, Creflo has made a lot of money off his ministering. He was one of the six pastors that the 2007 Senate probe tried to investigate, but most of the pastors didn't want to cooperate with the investigation. But Creflo was reportedly the least cooperative, and that might be because he didn't want people looking into his fortune. He claims that he doesn't make a salary from his church. They all claim this. It's so stupid. And that his money comes from his side business projects, which are direct relation and funded by the church. Whether or not he profits off his ministry is a matter of debate, but some of his money went towards his luxurious mansion and some of his very nice cars. He also said his church gifted him a Rolls Royce. <laughs> and he just couldn't turn it down. It's just such a nice present. Why not a Honda Civic? No. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a role in luxury. But some of that money went towards a private jet, a 1984 Learjet. The reason? Creflo claimed that commercial airlines didn't fly his schedule. Creflo was able to use that jet for many years, but at some point, it started having significant mechanical troubles. An engine once went out on a flight to Australia. However, the pilot was able to land the plane safely at their destination. In another instance, Creflo's wife and his three daughters were coming back from London on the plane when it skid off the runway during departure. You'd think these things would be signs. The jet was damaged and had to be taken out of service. So what was the solution? Fly commercial, of course. No, I'm just kidding. Creflo told his followers that God wanted him to own a private jet worth $65 million. And he asked for their donations to pay for it. The jet would apparently be used on evangelism missions to bring food and other provisions to people in need. Creflo had a different jet before, but it was from the 80s, and it started to wear out. So they wanted a new one, of course, but not just any jet. He was asking for a Gulfstream G650, or a G6 as it's commonly referred to. Gulfstreams are like some of the nicest pri you know, private jets like or a jets G6, out there. These are literally maybe? what like billionaires, Mark Cuban, mm -hmm. and... Um, you know, some of these Grant Cardone, some of these big, big investor guys fly around on. So it just tells you how luxurious these are and how expensive they are. Because keep in mind, there are other jets you can buy that are significantly less expensive than the G6. The song is called Like a G6 for a reason, but for some reason they needed the most expensive jet on the market to spread the word of God, which is, makes no sense. Why would you get the most expensive jet on the market if you're going to be like using it to take supplies to people in need around the world and things like that? Well, it's obvious that's not what they're actually doing. But apparently they needed the jet because they wanted to fly 100,000 pounds of food and other supplies to their destination. Keep in mind the max weight limit for the G6 is 100,000 pounds. The luggage capacity is also just 2,500 pounds. To carry lots of supplies, Creflo would need a cargo plane instead. And I'd assume that fuel costs would increase as that weight goes up, which would of course be paid for through tithes. The money these televangelists could save could go to people in need. If each member of his 200,000 strong congregation paid $300, they'd be able to buy the plane. Let's uh, see the Dollar Ministries <laughs> fundraising pitch for this plane. <laughs> it's so ironic oh, that it's the Dollar Ministries. <laughs> As airplanes get older, they get less reliable. The plane's 30 years old. Sad music. And this is nothing that's basically you, it's not like a car where you can pull over on the side when something goes wrong. And uh, I knew it was time to begin to believe God uh, for a, a new airplane. Our current ministry plane is no longer usable. We need your help. And I ask all of our partners globally Please to get on board with Project G650. We are believing for 200,000 people to give contributions of 300 US dollars or more to make this a reality. If all of our existing partners were to sow $300 each from all over the world, we'd be able to acquire this jet in a very, very short period of time. But any contribution or gift amount is graciously appreciated as we continue to spread the gospel of grace. This is so absurd and abusive. It, it seems like a skit. Mm -hmm. Also, why do both him and Jesse say, believe me for the plane? Like, believe me. 
for? Yeah, maybe they're like, I don't know. Why are, what do they mean by that? What do you mean? Believe me for the plane? That's what they say. That God is telling them like, oh, Jesse, believe, believe me. me for the plane. Right. It's all right. good. Oh, it's all faith, right? right. It's all faith-based. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, if you believe enough, I'll, I'll make it happen. A blessing. And that's, that's, that's the other thing, too, is like, it's so easy for anybody to be like, yeah, God told me that I need it. It's like... But it doesn't make sense because you're not you're not believing God for the plane. That's not how you got the plane. You got the plane because people donated money. Right, yeah. right. But if you make but people think that it was God, then people are more apt to write a check versus just mm-hmm. if he was just saying it without God involved, then they might get confused. But either way, right. people were still suspicious of this ask. Um, even his own, or I guess former congregation members, here was his response to the backlash. Yeah, people were pissed. I can believe God as long as I want to. If I want to believe God for a $65 million plane, you cannot stop me. You cannot stop me from dreaming. Creflo Dollar asking his members for a $65 million. I ain't never ask you for a dime. What are you talking about? They discover life on Mars. If you think a $65 million plane was too much, if they discover that there's life on Mars, they're going to need to hear the gospel, and I'm going to have to believe God for a billion-dollar space shuttle because we got to preach the gospel <laughs> on Mars. Dude. Why is he saying that he's never asked anyone for a cent? Yeah. You, do we need to play your video again, sir? Yes, you well, certainly Well, other did. people ask on his behalf. So he's, oh, he's saying okay. it's not him. Oh. But... Mm. Whoever nice. the, this project is is asking for it, but just from that statement right there, you're basically asking for it. You right. know what I mean? In in a in a non direct way, aggressive, yeah. right? It's like it, it's just I just can't stand how manipulative these these oh, televangelists evil. are. It's just they're preying on people's emotions too, and mm-hmm. obviously by being this charismatic, like outspoken guy, and you know the theatrics of it and everything, mm-hmm. it gets everybody right. Everyone's like, yeah. I believe. You know what I mean? A big, give me a billion dollar space shuttle to go <laughs> preach the gospel to the Martians. Yeah. It's just like, oh, man. Uh. Well, after he got a lot of backlash, Project 650 was abandoned. APR rep for the church said that Creflo will be flying commercial now. Oh, man. Watch so, out for them demons. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Prayers up for poor Creflo and his family who now have to deal with the horror of flying first class mm. with the demons in the tube. Mm-hmm. Scary times, man. Yeah. However, a few weeks later, the church announced that they were ready to purchase the plane after all. It all worked out for them. We don't know for sure if Dollar Ministries went through with the purchase, but there's a chance Creflo has been saved from flying on a tube full of the demons. Demons. Um, also, it's worth mentioning that in 2012, Creflo was arrested for choking and slapping his 15-year-old daughter during an argument. What? I didn't know that. The daughter had called 911 and told the operator she felt unsafe, and this was not the first time this had happened. Creflo was arrested and charged with misdemeanor simple battery and cruelty to children. Of course, he denied choking and punching his daughter to his congregation, and the charges were dismissed in 2013 after Creflo was required to enroll in an anger management program, report to probation, and pay a little over $1,000 in court fees. That's so absurd and abusive. I mean, for but him to only that, pay that, that much. I mean, that just shows, though, the fuck? his true colors, right? Like, Oh, yeah. It's all an act. It he is. doesn't really believe what he's saying. It's just a way to make money. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a business. They're, they're CEOs. They're yeah. just CEOs of their business. Is Which really is like are. fine if you pay taxes. Yeah. Right, right. All right, well... We also have to talk about Miss Paula White today. So Paula White is a televangelist pastor who preaches from her Apopka, Florida church, known as the City of Destiny. Throughout her preaching career, she's made a lot of money, and she also has close ties with Trump. She also has seen her fair share of controversy, of course. She founded the Without Walls International Church in Tampa, Florida, with her second husband, Randy White, in 1991, and the success of their first church allowed them to open a 10,000-seater satellite church in Lakeland, Florida. So she had run off with Randy after leaving her first husband at age 18. She got married super young, and he was a Maryland pastor with a wife and kids at the time. She became very successful as a preacher and televangelist, 
so much so that she was able to afford the luxuries in life like a mansion, multiple luxury cars, and even a private jet that was paid for, of course, by her ministry. Later in the mid-2000s, Paula started to hit tough times. In 2004, the IRS started to investigate her and her ministries. And in 2007, she and other prominent and very wealthy televangelists were subject to a Senate Finance Committee probe. And tragically, the ministry had to sell their Gulfstream private jet. In 2009, she and Randy divorced and her TV ratings took a sharp decline and things only got worse from there. Paula was later caught in Rome having an affair with the prosperity gospel televangelist Benny Hinn. Of course, Paula denied the affair, but Benny admitted to having an inappropriate relationship with her. The Lakeland Church had to close its doors in 2012, and in 2014, Without Walls had to file for bankruptcy after reportedly defaulting on $29 million in loans. Paula said that she suffered a stroke and got re-addicted to prescription pills, but she was able to make a comeback. Back in 2002, Paula had become the spiritual advisor to Donald J. Trump, after they started doing Bible study together, which is a very, very interesting site to a picture. <laughs> According to James Dobson, the founder of Focus on the Family, Paula was the one who converted Trump to Christianity. We should do a whole episode on Focus on the Family. I know a lot about Focus on the Family. Yeah, you went to that, didn't you? Yeah, well, it's in Colorado Springs is where yeah. it's based. Yeah, Yeah, there's an interesting story there, too. So just, yeah, so James Dobson is one of the most influential evangelical Christian leaders in America, and Focus on the Family is massive and has massive influence over all Christians, really, and all Christian denominations. I mean, they had, like, Focus on the Family growing up for me had, on their website, they would have a review, like, system for all secular music and movies, and so... Whenever I would say, hey, I want to go see this movie, my parents would type in the movie title into the Focus on the Family website, <laughs> and then it would come back with a review done by one of their reviewers there. Wow. And nine times out of 10, it would be like, it would be like, this has sexual themes and overtones. Mm. Do not let your kids do. And it would write all these like Christian reviews on everything. So even like the Coldplay album, uh, Clocks and what's it, Clocks and Sounds or something. Um, like uh, even speed out, of sound speed of sound yeah and so, clocks yeah uh, there's songs on it yeah so i that was like one of the first secular albums i ever got for my birthday and i remember they went and did like a search on it and it was one of the very few secular albums that i was able to keep oh because really cold play because in the review is like well it seems like cold play front man crit what's his name uh chris something yeah oh i forget chris martin chris martin is a christian Oh, he is. That's just what it said at the time. I think there was like, maybe he gave an interview one point, say, but I mean, look at the guy now. You think? Yeah, I don't yeah. think he is now. So that was like one of the albums. But focus on the family kind of writes the framework for a lot of a lot of things in the in the Christian world. Interesting. So it's almost like their own version of Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, except way more in depth and oh, more in depth. Yeah, it would, it, and they review like everything. Mm. So that parents can go there and like get the, you know, if a parent doesn't know who somebody is, they can go search it on Focus on the Family and get the real scoop on it. So that's why your parents gave a big no to Eminem. Absolutely. <laughs> I would love to read we, their we'll review we, on that. Well, if we do cover that, we'll have to like pull some reviews from their website and read them because some mm. of them are pretty funny. They're like Reliant K. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then movies, of course, it was like did not like most movies unless it was like even they would even rate PG movies like kids movies. They'd be like, this Disney movie has sexual overtones. Do not show Nemo to your kids. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Harry Potter obviously was a big no-no oh, yeah, for me big at no. first. I had, to, I, had to find, I had to sneak that one for a while. Oh, that's so insane. Yeah. yeah. It's a story. I know. But it's about witchcraft and wizardry. So anyway, back to Paula Light. Oh, Paula Light. Paula White, you mean? <laughs> Paula White. From there... They became friends, and Trump appeared on Paula's show in 2008 to promote his book. In 2015, he invited her to the Apprentice finale to pray with the show's cast and crew. Then Trump announced his presidential campaign, and things changed. Paula became an important member of Trump's Evangelical Advisory Board. She helped mobilize evangelicals to throw their support behind Trump. She spoke at rallies and helped organize evangelical conservative gatherings, in support of him. When Trump was elected, Paula gave her invocation prayer at his inauguration. 
She served as one of his spiritual advisors through his presidency. So when he ran again, of course, Paula was supporting him. But on November 4th, 2020, as the election results were coming in, it started to look like maybe Trump wasn't going to win. So Paula held a service at her church. She was going to pray in order to hopefully change the results of the election. Here's this infamous clip from this prayer. It's pretty iconic. Strike and 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 strike until you have victory for every enemy that is aligned against you. Let there be that we would strike the ground for you will give us victory, God. I hear a sound of abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of shouting and singing. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. The Lord says it is done. The Lord says it is done. The Lord says it is done. I put an for I hear victory, behind victory, this. victory. Oh, Didn't they do sure. that actually? The I am sure they got I'm, I'm pretty sure I remember heaven. hearing one. Can we look victory, that up? Victory, 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 victory. Angels are being released right now. Angels are being angels released. Are being right oh, now. Woo. Oh, oh, she goes hard. The guy behind me. <laughs> The angels have even been dispatched from Africa right now. From Africa, Africa right, right now. now. Africa, Africa right, now. right now. From Africa right now. They're coming here. They're coming here. In the name of Jesus from South America. They're coming here. They're coming here. They're coming here. They're coming here. They're coming from here. Africa. From South America. Angelic forces. Angelic reinforcement. Angelic reinforcement. Okay. Angelic reinforcement. No more? Are you sure? Pika I would like to hear the remixed version. Can we look up sure. Paula White remix? Sure. It's pretty good if I remember right. This is just just comedy to me, honestly. I'm it's just like it's just fucking hilarious. It's so far off from where it should be. Atka, atka. And strike 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 until you have victory for every enemy that is on the honestly. It is. Let there be that we would strike the ground for you will give us victory. The audience. I hear a sound of abundance of rain. Get the clap going. Hey. Damn. God's like, ooh, do I hear a bop? Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of them. Beautiful. What about this one? Let's see. Strike and strike and strike and strike until you have victory for every enemy that is aligned against you. Let there be that we would strike the ground for you will give us victory. I hear a sound. Hey. Oh, the trap beat. <laughs> oh, Kenneth was in there. Woo. Get it. Get them all together. I want to see all good. the televangels together for a live show. Get up. Wait, is that, <laughs> is that Rudy Giuliani in a... Wait. <laughs> oh, my God. It's amazing. Oh, I love it. Whoever and made Steve this. Bannon. God bless you. Named angels are being dispatched right now. <laughs> this is amazing, dude. I love Kenneth Gumpler, dude. That motherfucker is so funny. He really is. Like, I'll give it to hey, these guys. Hey. These guys are dude, serious I'm gonna, entertainers. Like, request, request, request this at the club next time I'm there. That is a fucking bop. They are world class entertainers. Yes. Put them on a cruise ship, and everybody's coming to that show. That's true. <laughs> the cruise ship. <laughs> Talk. You really want to spread the word of God? You should be on every cruise ship. Yeah, they should drop an EDM beat between you know, every all resort. Of their things. Yeah. Very good. So entertaining. Very good. Extremely harmful, but very yeah, entertaining. Very damaging. <laughs> very bad for your spirit, but. And as we know, it worked. Paula White and the Angels were able to change the results of the election, and Trump and won. Donald Trump is our president. Another one Woo. of God's infinite miracles. Amazing. Round of applause. Paula believes heavily in seed faith and makes no bones about it. She recommends that her followers give tithes or 10% of their gross income to their church or to her church. Paula once said, every time we give, something supernatural happens. Money just gets drained out of your <laughs> bank account. <laughs> it's really quite magical. Everyone gives Paula money and God uses his power to turn that money into a new Mercedes Benz for Paula. She got that cushy new ride. Yes, that's right. Part of Paula's personal wealth includes several Mercedes that she owns. Also, a Bentley was once photographed in her garage. Nice. She and her husband once owned a private jet, like all the other televangelists we've covered today. At one point, Paula lived in a $2.2 million waterfront mansion in Tampa, 
According to a Senate report one year later, Paula's church and her personal ministry used tax-exempt ministry funds to pay almost $1 million, like $900,000 for this mansion. The church also paid for multi-million dollar salaries for Paula and her family members, as well as their private jet travel. Paula also owned two snazzy New York condos, <laughs> one in Trump Park Avenue building and one in Trump Tower. Of course, they're in Trump's buildings. Gave her a little, you know, friends and family discount. Mm -hmm. So why not? In March of 2020, while COVID was just beginning to rip through the country, Paula gave her ministry an important message after a COVID-related prayer session. Roll the tape. Yep, this was part of the message, people. We are a hospital to the sick, not necessarily the physically sick, but we are a hospital for those who are soul sick, those who are spiritually sick. Maybe you'd like to sow a $91 seed, <laughs> and that's just putting your faith with Psalm 91 or maybe $9 or whatever God tells you to do. Mm. If you want to be a blessing to Paula White Ministry or City of Destiny, you can go to the website at paulawhite.org. We would love for you to help us and stand with us. Of course you would. We'd love for you to stand with your church. Don't forget, now is not the time to abandon your covenant with God. I would love it's the time that you go deeper. It's time to go deeper into those pockets. All right. Get your piggy banks <laughs> out. Empty them. Look Smash your, those bitches. Before you put your jeans in the wash, make sure you clear those coins out and put them in an envelope. <laughs> My way. Send them straight to Paula White, <laughs> why City we, of Destiny. Why do you guys acquire such thick Southern accents when you talk? I don't know. Because she's, she's Paula White. <laughs> oh, man. Sick. Yeah. Yeah. That's really what it is. It is. Sick. It's funny, but it's also fucking It's not going sick. to any, anything good at all. Mm-mm. Going to the Botox she gets every week. <laughs> Paula made it clear that none of this money would go to coronavirus relief efforts. The money would be going towards the church. But still, she was accused of using the virus as a fundraising technique while people were sick, dying, losing their jobs, losing their homes. But Paula is still preaching at City of Destiny and to television audiences across the country. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. <laughs> so if you want to pray with Paula, Maybe send her some coin for that new car. You know just where to find her. You know what? I'm going to send her some Chuck E. Cheese tokens. <laughs> yeah, she likes that. Okay. <laughs> I got some extra tokens I've saved. By the way, if you want to see what some of these Jesus Jets are up to, you can check the Twitter handle, Pastor Planes. The account is set up by a Christian watchdog group, the Trinity Foundation, and they want to hold these televangelists accountable for their spending which usually is under a cloud of secrecy, of course. Mega churches in general have seen a decline in attendance since the pandemic, but these pastors are all still active today, spreading the word of God through private jet trips and promises of health and wealth, all just for a few hundred dollar seeds a month. I know we've been laughing a lot in this episode because obviously a ton yeah. of it is hilarious. It is. But if you think about the bigger picture here, it is quite sad. Like, oh, yeah, there are people who are suffering, living without, you know, a home, living on the streets in these very towns that these people are preaching in. And, you know, I'm not a expert on religion, but it seems as though Jesus was preaching to help people who were poor and help people who were sick and help people 100%. who were in need. And it's just so unbelievably scary that this is what these people have turned Jesus's word into and are now you know, living these types of lifestyles. Mm -hmm. They're abusing them spiritually for personal gain. It's disgusting. It's just, it's disappointing because it, it does give all Christians sort of a bad, bad rap, right? Especially I'd for those that aren't familiar with or, you know, have ever been to a good church before. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the really like difficult thing for me is like, clearly this is not, this is such, this is like the 1% of, yeah. Of Christians, right, that are mm -hmm. that participate in this, and but it all, also feel bad for the people in their congregations mm -hmm. that fall for their their bullshit every week and mm -hmm. continue to give them money. And I mean, it's when you look at it, it's really, really no different than anybody that's any other s sort of cult, right? Yeah. I mean, you look at people in Scientology, and mm -hmm. you look at people um, who just join like Keith Raniere's. Mm -hmm. I mean, people that follow these self help gurus and Nixium. things like that that think they're going to Nexium and other groups like it that. People, because ultimately the people that are going to these are getting groups are getting sucked in because they they think that there's going to be something there that's going to help them. Mm -hmm. And when you go and see this pastor, he's got these fancy suit on and he's, 
you know, he's living this life of luxury. It's obviously something everybody wants, right? Everybody wants to have an abundance of, uh, of, you know, things and, you know, wants to have personal wealth and all, you know, and they literally cater their sermons to these different things. And that's mm -hmm. how they draw them in. And that's how they keep, keep you coming back is they're like, Oh, well look what it, it's worked for me. So mm -hmm. it can work for you as well. I mean, it's, it's, Look like at, they're perfect victims to go after. Exactly. So people come in and then they hear this really motivational speech from Joel Osteen and, you know, they see how happy he is and how loved he is mm -hmm. by the congregation. It's like, I want to be like him. I want a piece and so of that. And so if, yeah, if he's telling you, this is how you be like me, mm -hmm. which I'm just, I'm being like Jesus is, and that's what's so, so fucked for me is like, they're twisting Jesus so much. Oh, like yeah. they're twisting the story of Jesus and the principles he stood for and the the actual person he was in order to fit their narrative to ultimately feed their ego and fill their pockets and and G, if jesus were here he would burn all these mega churches to the ground he would he would say this is all completely unnecessary it, it's it, this is not what it's about jesus would be just out in the park mm -hmm. talking to whoever would want to come by and listen to him and there would be no pressure there'd be no money collected and it would just be out of goodness that anybody would be there and, and contribute and, you know, bring supplies. And, you know, like th there, I mean, there's a story of, of Jesus preaching and, you know, they've been out there for, I think it was a few days or something. Sorry, my, my Bible knowledge is a little rusty. It's been, been a while since I've read the good book, but <laughs> in the story they're out there and he's just talking to this crowd of people and there's, there's no food. They're all hungry eventually. And so this one person brought some loaves of bread and some fish. And it was like all the food that he had, like literally everything he had. And this, this man was willing to give up all the food that he had on him that was for his family and, and himself to feed everybody else. Mm -hmm. And because he did this, because of this gesture, Jesus was able to multiply the food and multiply the um, you know the fish and everything and feed the hungry crowd mm -hmm. but it the lesson of it was this even though this person had very little he was still willing to give you just kind of give you the shirt off your back type of theology right of like mm -hmm. you're that type of person you're that salt of the earth human being that doesn't matter how little you have you're still willing to give that just, without expecting anything in return and that's where these preachers are twisting it and being like well if you give this and you're going to get it back tenfold that's not something yeah. that i remember jesus ever ever preaching of like no, it's totally give me backwards. your food and then yeah i'll deliver you know a hundred pizzas to you tomorrow <laughs> it's like no it was it didn't work that way it's just giving in good faith whether or not you get something in return or not because it's about being a good person right not about getting more for it's yourself not, this isn't in the this they, they talk like they're stockbrokers they're like if yeah. you invest in the church mm -hmm. you give a hundred dollars oh it's so that twisted. over time is gonna build and compound and then you'll get paid out it's just it's so backwards and twisted that uh, we know I, some like good Christians who would be so offended by all of these people. And I think the majority of I think I'd hope the majority of Christians would really reject all of this and be disgusted by it. Yeah, I would say so. I would say and in most in those that are listening and watching, I mean, I'm sure you're going to chime in in the comments like this is not mm -mm. something that your church it couldn't be further does. from the word of God. And no. biblical teachings from the little I've, you know, heard and seen. It's it's so off from that. Well, it's like at the end of the day, it's all about your personal relationship with God, mm -hmm. and that's all. That's really what Christianity is all about. That's really what spiritualism is all about. It's about your own personal relationship with your Creator, right? Right. And so, by by taking that and then manipulating it in order to improve one's, you know, stance in society, their wealth and their material things is just is no different than any other scammer out there. It's really no different. You're no. taking advantage of people. No, this this whole thing is honestly it could be a true crime episode. This is criminal what these people are doing. Yeah, well, and they're manipulating the the tax code and the IRS and mm -hmm. you know, it's very very easy to to become a tax exempt organization or a church. There's really, you know, and, and that's a big issue too that needs to be dealt with. Like the fact that churches aren't taxed is is insane. It, they should absolutely be taxed. And, for sure and we would probably eliminate a lot of these issues that we have with these mega churches and televangelists if they were taxed like a business if they're being if they're bringing in the fun and maybe there's a limit maybe like the smaller churches that are because obviously if you're just a small church mm -hmm. meeting in a school or something and you have no money you really have no congregation 
the money is very minimal. A lot of these pastors are doing it for free. I mean, there's a lot of volunteers within churches. And that's one thing I want to note is today we focus primarily and specifically on mega churches that have an overabundance of resources and money. Mm -hmm. But most churches, I'd say like 90% of churches are volunteer driven. It's people just out of the goodness of their hearts, dedicating time to watch to watch kids and do childcare and, and go on youth group missions. I, I had so many sort of sponsors at my church that really weren't get, getting paid anything. They were just giving up their time because they thought it was for a worthwhile cause. And they were coming along on these mission trips with us and, and, and spending time with the youth just to be a good an influence on them. And they weren't getting paid anything. And it wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the the status or anything like that. And, and, and that's what it's all about is just being there for one another and in just trying to be a good person ultimately yeah and the, the your people, own personal relationship with your creator the people that we know that believe in the word of god seem to be very low-key actually yeah. materialistically you know um a lot of them don't seem to be into the flashy stuff and they're they're in it for the right reason because they really do believe so it's just it's so so twisted well and it to me it just shows that these televangelists are just are probably the least spiritual people you'll meet for sure because if you are truly a spiritual person and you're truly getting in touch with something greater than yourself the first thing that gets eliminated is your ego mm -hmm. and after that everything else falls away but they've convinced themselves that they have this nice life and all these things because they're such a good Christian that God has rewarded them with all of that. So they they are under, under the impression that they're one of the best out there. Right. Because and it this reflects is all, in their life. The, they made this themselves, though. This right. isn't something that's, that's So they don't found. want to feel any shame about it. And, of course, they twist it into anything they need to to feel good about their lives. Yeah. Uh, that's they're truly really insane. Yeah. You want to talk about demons? <laughs> they're right here. I agree. I was um, just looking at kind of doing some research of what it actually takes to start up a church, and it is surprisingly easy. Yeah. It really is not, doesn't seem at least that complicated or that difficult to be able to do. And No, we can start mean, one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pretty much anybody can start a church. It's but, just like, how do you sustain that church? And that's the hard, it's, that's hard to start a church because you do have to create this financial structure around it in order to support mm -hmm. it and grow it yeah but i'm talking about in order to start a church so you can be tax, tax exempt. exempt yeah right. like it is not that hard. no in fact john oliver did a really great segment yeah. on evangelists and or uh televangelists and he he applied for tax tax exempt status pretended he had a church and because they meet every sunday for recording the show yeah he, he was he eligible requirements yeah 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 insane so it's really that easy and clearly we need it and that's the thing is every time we do try to go down that road because of how much power the you know these televangelists and others in this world have and here here's my thing too is there is supposed to be the separation of church and state correct yep that's literally be. a thing that should but that's not the case Chur churches and the, like you heard with um paula She's over there, you know, and and Kenneth talking about Joe Biden and Paula's, you know, behind Trump and things like that. So it's like they are throwing, you know, they're throwing their power and their weight behind the political candidates that they want and behind the causes that they want within the government. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, that politicians are bending a knee to them because they want they don't want to go against these people because they have huge bases of people behind them that could potentially be voters for them. Right. Could be their right. constituents. So. Mm -hmm. they don't do anything about it. And so the cycle just continues on and on and on. And I don't see it breaking anytime soon. I think no. it, I, it, we would have... It's too strong. Yeah, it would. people would be up in arms if if all of a sudden churches were taxed like a, a business. Yeah. I mean, it would be it'd be a major, major thing. And so I don't think it's going to change anytime soon, unfortunately. Yeah, probably not. But as a, as if you're a Christian or a spiritual person, like you can choose who you support. You can mm -hmm. choose... The, you know the places that you go to worship and you know it's, it's sometimes worth looking into who's leading your church because you never know sometimes the people who you believe are the most holy devout believers are but, oftentimes and to be clear you can be a spiritual person without being part of an organized religion and i think you, your church can technically be anywhere i always like to say nature is my church i i, I felt feel the that. most spiritual in my life in the most serene places on this planet and mm. 
that's where I feel a connection to a higher power is in, yeah. in nature. Like, why wouldn't it be in nature? Why do <laughs> you need to be in these man-made walls and lights mm-hmm. and stuff like that? Like, yeah. I can just sit in a quiet meadow and feel like I'm somewhere else, right? We should go sit in a quiet meadow right now. <laughs> <laughs> I need to cleanse after watching all these fucking idiots. <laughs> But yeah, that's our uh, take yeah. on televangelists. Yeah, we definitely want to hear all of your thoughts, and I'm sure we will hear them. Thoughts and opinions, yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, we're not saying all Christians are bad. Okay, we've made it clear. <laughs> they know. So be be kind. Be kind to one another. Mm-hmm. We will be back next week, of course, and we want you to keep taking your mind a mile higher, but we wanted to leave you with a great compilation that one of our editors here made that really puts all of this into perspective. Shout out to James, the editor. No, I would no, I would love, rather have all the money and the government run great without the money, and I'd give it away to other people. But you know, I don't think you know. Obviously, it's not practical. We gotta. Did you like being rich? Well, I like being able to help others. I like being able to fulfill my dreams, and you know, it, it takes money to do what we're doing. I was on television. He said, "I heard you was a millionaire." I said, "That's not right. That's not true." He said, "Yes, it." I said, "No, it's not." Multi. Now, add that to it, you'll be all right. (laughs) One of my chandeliers costs more than most people's house. I got 22 chandeliers in the house. God told me to have that plant. For a pastor, you are living a life of luxury. You've got great homes. You've got great planes. You you drive in limos. I'm a very wealthy man. You're a very wealthy man. Yes. Tyler's one of the greatest guys. He made it. He made that airplane so cheap for me, I couldn't help but buy it. 